get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, consultants, create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. Go to Rise25.com, learn more. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. Make sure to check out our dream product ladder template, which helps people plan their dream business on one sheet of paper. I am very excited. This is a long time coming, and we've spent many times at conferences together. Today, we have Kim krause Schwam, one of the top direct response copywriters. She's worked in the industry for more than 25 years, creating breakthrough copy for companies like Boardroom, National Geographic, Healthy Directions, Rodale, Soundview, and that's just to name a few. She was integral in launching a nutritional supplement company, Healthy Directions, that went on to become a multi-million dollar business within the first few years alone. And she was the first female copywriter to have a control at Boardroom. Kim, thanks for joining me. Hey, it's great to be here finally, Jeremy. So there's a lot we can cover here, but I wanted to go back to 1992, Phillips Publishing, what you did there, and just take us take us back. Uh, it was such a great turning point in my career. I had worked in uh, the health insurance industry in marketing and uh, learned you know did some direct marketing and was a brand manager. Uh, when I came to Phillips Publishing in the early '90s, they had just entered the alternative health space, which was mm. just in its infancy, but it was right. exploding. It's hard to believe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I I've, I've I've been in the health space for a very for a long time. What did the alternative health space look like at that time? What was around? There were uh, some small uh, kind of quirky catalogs that mm-hmm. had a lot of alternative products. There were some people who were marketing their own like programs and products, but there wasn't a whole lot out there. And Phillips Publishing uh, was in the business of you know primarily they were a newsletter publisher, and on the consumer side, they had um, mostly leadership driven, personality driven newsletters. Uh, primarily on the investment side, you know, people like Mark Skousen and Richard Band, etc. Um, on the health side, they hadn't had too much success in the more conventional health space. And then they came across Dr. Julian Whitaker, who was an MD, uh, but he uh, had studied with Linus Pauling, and he, mm. you know, had a, you know, written books on alternatives to, you know, treating heart disease, diabetes, etc. So they launched a newsletter with him called Health and Healing. That must have been really was, controversial at the time. It was kind of controversial. Um, they got, uh, I think they touched a lot of nerves with their marketing. I mean, I, this this marketing part was done before I came to the company, but they had Clayton Migpiece, uh Everybody here has probably heard of him, fantastic copywriter. And he wrote a breakthrough uh, package for them that mailed just millions of names and it yeah it definitely was controversial i mean it was talking about you know drugs that were bad for you and other treatments that were better and you know don't trust doctors of the fda or whatever I and mean, right. he was really very much a, a pioneer in that area um a maverick you know so to speak um but you know, he had the credentials and he was very passionate and he had his own wellness clinic in newport beach where you know he was having a lot of success treating patients with uh, more alternative type therapies as well as conventional but you know getting really great results and people would go to his clinic and you know turn their lives around so uh, they very quickly had over 300,000 subscribers wow. for a newsletter which you know is just like huge um, it dwarfed uh, even their most successful financial newsletters that's and a paid what, newsletter these are paid it yep. was um, not as expensive as a financial newsletter but it was typically $39 a year yeah. And some people would just come right in at two year subscription. Wow. And one of the things Phillips was very done, very good at doing was, uh, you know, what is the back end? What else can we sell this person? How else can we serve them? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they were very good at either cross selling their other uh, newsletters and products 
or in this case, um, you know, creating insert programs. Again, these these were back in the day. This is everything was through the mail. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of pre internet. Your son's like, what's that? So no. <laughs> I know the newsletter would actually come in a number 10 envelope in your mailbox. And it would be stuffed with some different inserts promoting different things that might be relevant to mm -hmm. to that subscriber. Yeah. So, um, when so what I was keep, the back end like? So you said there so were there inserts. There was really no real back end okay, for this yeah. newsletter. They were trying some different products. And when I first joined the company, I was brought in to, uh, I was, there was like four or five of us that were just basically scouting out different alternative health products, sometimes creating them in house if it was like an information product. Um, you know, negotiating the, jo the joint venture deal, writing the copy for the insert, it could be anywhere from two to six pages, and then we would just put it out there and see, because it was a pretty low-cost way of testing. Yeah. You know, is it going to fly already mailing or is it going to bomb? Yeah. Yeah, because it's already writing along with the newsletter. Yeah. So we were just constantly testing, and one of the great lessons I learned from that, being part of that, was, um, and part of this came from the leadership of the division, who was Bob King, who was president of the consumer division, um, he's like, you know, if you weren't taking enough risk, you weren't trying enough new things, mm. you know, so it was okay to fail. They encouraged it. Yeah. It was, and, you know, I, the company hasn't always, I don't know if it was able to keep that kind of attitude with new leadership and as it went through different changes to where it is today. But I've seen that in other companies where people are afraid to take risks. They're afraid to be wrong and afraid to try something. And that's yeah. kind of like the kiss of death for your business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you really always want to encourage smart risk but people taking right. risk and not people not feeling that they're going to ruin their career if something doesn't work yeah um, where so did you find that people you know someone took a risk and it failed but out of it came something even better you remember one of those things that the one of those times that because oftentimes we scrutinize the we'll call it a learning whatever you call failure learning whatever it is um, and something better comes out the other end because of that learning. Well, I've, I've certainly had that lesson through many of my copywriting projects, yeah. especially earlier on in my career. Um, one of my uh, first big breaks when I finally left uh, Phillips after seven, six years and I went out to, on my own to be a freelance copywriter, and that was about 19 years ago. Um, after a few years out, I was... Uh, working on a bunch of renewals and other like smaller type projects for KCI Communications and they were mm -hmm. a big financial publisher. I never had, had a chance to write one of the big acquisition direct mail promos which is what every copywriter yearns to get to that level where they right. can you know go up against the big boys. It's like the World and, Series of Copywriters. And yeah it's like it's like going from you know high school football to you know NFL you know <laughs> and you want to be able to you know get that chance to make the big royalties etc so I finally after writing all this all this great copy for them on the back end uh, for their back end uh, type things uh, got a chance to write an acquisition <clears throat> promotion for their flagship newsletter and uh, That's for the personal finance so this was for personal yeah, finance and uh, so I was you know I was feeling pretty confident I had written a lot of stuff for them and um, I'm like, I'm going to take this really out-of-the-box approach. And the economy was really in the toilet. I think it was around 1992 or, 19, or 2002. I feel like the economy's Getting, always on the verge. Yeah. Of people, been, depending on who you talk to. Or not, it's been good. Right, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to take a sip of water here. Yeah, I'm looking at the personal finance issue. It's interesting. Anyone should go and check out, if I can point them right now to your website, um, Kim Schwalm. It's spelled K M. S C H W A L M, and you have some amazing resources there um, with portfolio and other other things. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm looking at um, the personal finance one with you know the surprise winners and losers in today's grim market reality, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that was. I'm going to get to that in a second. Hold on, uh, I'm going to grab something. If yeah. I can. Go ahead. Yeah, if there's anything uh, you want to show on screen, let's I have let's some show, show and tell Yes, here. I want to see it. Yeah. It'll go with the story. Okay, so since you're telling this, uh, the story here. Um, okay, so I finally get my big break, right? And guess who I'm going up against? It's Jim Rutz, uh, the legendary Jim Rutz, uh, very unbeatable. Like, yeah, I think they paid him like $100,000 just to write one promotion because it was always almost sure to be like a huge, you know, it would like, double your business or triple your business and wow. so he had the uh uh he had the control and it was this Let's can you see, see that 
What yeah. I couldn't tell you during the election campaign. So this was the front cover. Yeah. It was a Magalog. And it looked like it was coming from President Bush at the it time. It does look like yeah, it's yeah, very presidential. Very valuable. You're not going to throw this away, you know, kind of thing. But I have this out of the box idea that, you know, I'm going to put a big Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> if people are listening, you should go watch this. But the change is a big picture it's, of it's the change a, monster that ate the economy. Yes. I mean, I've got a picture of you know Bush and. Alan Greenspan and all that on here, but um, and you know the copy was pretty good, but it was just like you know I'm gonna just take this out of the box approach. Well, guess what? It didn't beat Jim Rutz. Oh well, you know, and I could have at that point just said that's it. I suck. I'll never make it. And Casey, I could have been like, never show your face around here again. You know, why did we pay you all this money and blah blah blah? But you know, good companies know that not everybody is going to bat a thousand. Um, even the top copywriters don't always bat a thousand. Yeah. And sometimes it's you know you if you got somebody who's done other good work for you you know you give them another chance. So sure enough, about six months later they gave me another chance. And um, kind of lucky for me, uh, Jim Rutz got a cease and desist letter from the White House. <laughs> lucky for you. <laughs> regarding his. Uh, I was going to say like because it had a... the presidential seal. <laughs> right. It looks pretty official. Yeah, so they had to change um, his front cover. He changed it. So he changed it to this. And, you know, it looks like a special report magazine. It's right. not as official. It's a bit more looking. promotional looking. Right. right. Boomflation, yeah. So I went with a slightly more, cons or a lot more conservative approach. And I one of the lessons I learned is look valuable, right? When you're, when mm. you're, or your promotion whether you're dating or in marketing too there you go or you're going for a job interview or whatever right look valuable um, but your promotion should look valuable because as you know you're you know whether it's coming to you through your email and you're going to a sales page or whether it's something you get in the mailbox you're making that split-second decision do I want to look at this or is it trash you know and so you want to look valuable so if you look really promotional Chances are, and it kind of depends on the product in the market, but many times that doesn't work as well. So I looked like a faux mm. newsletter. Yeah, right? I like that. Pretty yeah. much what the newsletter looks like, and it we call it an issue log. Mm. And um, so this is what beat Jim Rutz, and it went that on to really cool. for about three years, and uh, with different yeah. updates, which is a long time for a financial promotion to be a control. Oh yeah. And yeah, so it talk about that. show that one more time, Kim, because what's interesting, what I like about it is there's a lot of really interesting things here. How does this work? Because there's a team working, you're having to write the copy. There's probably some layout and design stuff. Because um, I like the special issue on the front, like makes it look like it's just yeah. like this valuable thing that someone shouldn't throw away. How do you come to that? Like, can you talk about the team input on the layout and because you probably give a direction on the copy stuff, and it probably you have to work on the layout as well. How does that uh, fit into everything there? So a lot of it just comes from the vision of the copywriter. Mm. So that was my vision. Yeah. Um, I you know, I decided there should be that you know, table of contents kind of sidebar on the front cover. So I wrote all the copy, even though it's a faux kind of issue. It really is all marketing copy. Yeah. So I wrote all the copy. And that's what I do for all my promotions. But then I do work very closely with a graphic designer, which in many cases is somebody outside the, the client's company. It's usually one of the top graphic designers. And so, um, I mean, I let them, you know, they kind of bring their whole perspective and magic to the table too. But I, I go through round by uh, every round of design. Mm -hmm. When I get it to a point that I think it's where it needs to be, then I usually show it to the client. So I, I stay very involved mm -hmm. with these promotions all the way through design. Do you find, Kim, that with finance, it do you, people should err on the side of conservative or the just this happen to work for this particular uh, package? Because like the presidential, obviously the seal, that's pretty conservative as opposed to the other two, the, the kind of dinosaur Godzilla or the, 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 boom, uh, the boom one. Um, <laughs> do you think that is... That follows a trend, or just so happens that that works for for these two. I think that it depends on the copywriter and mm -hmm. their level of expertise, and also the market and the product. So um, after my issue log, you know, promotion for personal finance became the control. There were like a ton of other 
all the financial ones started testing like similar type issue logs. So then we went to like a number 10 envelope that said current issue enclosed. And next thing I knew that that's all I was ever getting in my mailbox where everybody was mailing similar things. So sometimes people tend to follow like what other people were doing that's working. Right. But I definitely around that same period of time you had Clayton Makepeace writing, you know, very promotional looking promotions for, mm. you know, for Weiss, you know, um, publishing that for, I forget the guy's name that we're doing very well. So I, I don't see. think there's really any hard and fast rules. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. But I would say if you, my lesson that I learned and that I would teach to a copywriter who was, you know, kind of getting their first break or two would be maybe go a little bit more conservative until you really know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, cause you're probably going to give yourself the best odds of uh, success. Yeah. But I also know that that's something Gary Bensavanga talked about, you know, even, you know, throughout his career, you know, kind of maybe going a little more conservative to go for the sure thing, you know, because you want to give yourself the best odds of winning. Yeah. And so when you wrote the first piece, was there any, do you have to kind of advocate for yourself or they're like, Cam, just give it another try. Was it, um, you know, just a no brainer, like let's give her another shot at this. Or did you have to go back and go, listen, I can do this. No, I was kind of surprised. I honestly, I felt a little bit, um, a little humiliated like oh shoot I kind of blew it oh well you know but I had some other things with other clients too that were coming up that were giving me some shots you know at different promotions and I was having some successes there so I just you know that's one thing you have to have resilience as a copywriter or in yeah. business obviously as an entrepreneur um, you know you can't be it's like mental. Uh, you know yeah. yeah it's just a mental thing so I just kind of moved on and then I you know I was still doing some other work for them and then I got a call it's like hey we want you to we're gonna hire you to write all new package and I'm like cool you know um, so I felt really good about it and um, you know so I think that you know it paid off for them giving me that second chance yeah I want to talk about Kim definitely helping with the launch of healthy directions and I think you even came up with the name help come up with a name, but um, I want to pause for a second and talk about renewals because the sexy thing is obviously yeah. customer acquisition, but I think the, the really the steady of a business would be you have these existing customer base and yeah. you are writing a lot of renewals. Can you talk about what goes into a good renewal? Yeah, well, I, I tell you, it's probably been 15 years since I wrote them, yeah. but I will tell you, um, I mean, one of the very successful campaigns I did for KCI, it was funny, um, I got a call from their marketing director and he's like, oh yeah, I have this renewal insert I need you to write, but we kind of have a problem because we, we're going to be raising the price and so I don't know what, you know, how we're going to let people know about that and I'm Good like, question. ding, 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 I'm like, okay, you don't have a problem, you have an opportunity, right, mm -hmm. because now you've got like price rise campaign we can do mm, gotcha. where it's like price is going up you know last chance to you know lock in your savings renew for four years whatever you know this is like really a huge opportunity so um so we were gonna just do like three different inserts and but they kept in you know and we had a deadline whatever the hard deadline was like people must renew by x date you know and mm -hmm. that's when the price goes up and it was just funny because it was doing so well that we had to keep adding more efforts. So it was like, you know, we got to just keep this going, you know. So we had to come up with like, what's what's another story? Well, how, what, why are we going out there again to these people, you know. And um, I think the second effort we had said something about, okay, we extended the deadline and blah, blah, blah. But then we didn't tell them the specific deadline. So then the third mm. effort, I'm like, and, and he's like, oh, this goes on for three mistake. years. Like, no, it's not a mistake. This is going to be great. So <clears throat> in the headline we put, oops, we goofed, you know, with the headline and blah, blah, blah. And then the whole story, it's like, you know, we know you're also deadline oriented, but we never told you when the deadline even was. So now we're going to give you another 30 days. And that was like our best performing one. And then we did like, we ended up going out two more times, you know, but it was like, right. you know, it was just so much fun to do this. And here he thought, oh, this is going to be really hard. It was like, this was like their most successful renewal campaign. So then they started, we did it for all their, all their other products. <laughs> <laughs> and That's, even on your B2B newsletters. <laughs> that right there is worth the whole price of admission for someone's <laughs> whole career. I mean, that one tip, Kim, thank you for sharing that. Because <laughs> oftentimes this applies to any industry, any business. When there's a price increase, they should people should use it as an opportunity exactly. to actually promote the current pricing. 
and it, it almost mm. deepens your relationship with your cu customer too because you care about them you know yeah. it's like I, I really want you to be able to, to lock in you know the accountants in the back office are saying look everything's going up the postage costs are going up the printing costs are going up our office rents going up yeah. we have no choice I mean they I tried to keep this away as long as possible but they're breathing down my neck literally I got to do this, but I just, I care about you. I, this is something, you know, Lock it in. so it's like, it becomes a service. You're being in service to your customer and then you're going back again. Look, I'm just, I don't mean to bug you, but I really, this is really the last chance, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you approach it as a coming from a place of service to your customer. Yeah. And then it doesn't feel like you're just, you know, trying to, you know, just to have a promotion, just to have a promotion. Like you're actually, yeah. you know, the, people know that and, and they know like if you're actually going to be raising the price, it's out of integrity that you are telling them, but that you actually raise it. Right. Yeah. And they did. They did raise it. So I have to keep, this is, that was great. What else with renewals? The lock in the savings. What so else? another yeah. thing with renewals is um, let's talk kind of renewals from the standpoint of continuity, right? Yeah, yeah. When you have a consumable product to sell, yes, which a lot of people are obviously are in the supplement business these days. Yes. So coming from a publishing company with that publishing mentality of we have subscription based products and we're always renewing people, et cetera, you know, with that kind of focus, it's not a one time sale. Um, when we launched the Healthy Directions business, which was a subsidiary of a publishing company, um, we right out of the gate we built out like what we called at the time we called personal delivery service, but it was like a basically a till for bid you know auto ship program. An you know, auto ship, so, yeah. Yeah, so that was built right in. We built in what we would call basically the sim, you know in, the same thing as like a renewal series. But when somebody bought the the core program, which was a forty dollar a month supplement program with a multivitamin and fish oil and another supplement um, we'd get them on that and we would focus on getting them to renew whether it was buying again or ideally getting them to go right into auto ship and we built that all out right you know right as we launched so we weren't just how many one-time orders can we get through the door it was like you know getting them to become customers mm. longer term customers and uh, so I think that that really helped the company grow just right out of the gate and be profitable and also the first three four years we were just going to the back end of the health and healing list yeah so we didn't have the high cost and the challenges of acquiring customers outside of that we had people who were they were like, paying for the newsletter already to, but they're following dr whitaker's leadership and advice and so they want to take his vitamins and yeah there's definitely probably a lot more than they would spend on a multivitamin at the drugstore and it was like a 10 tablet a day multivitamin. Ten it was a tablets. 14 pill a day program Whoa. just to take the core program. Then there were other supplements you could buy. So That's intense. There was a, yeah, it was pretty it was very high potency. But um, so that's, you know, we just like I said, we had everything, not just the upfront promotions that we initially were just marketing through inserts in the newsletter, but just the whole back end. What would happen? We had the diagrams, you know, they'd go here, 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 here. And, and as we kept going and expanding, we had a catalog we put in the box. We discovered that, and I'm sure most people know this, but the whole hotline buyer thing is very, very true. You know, that we could get, we could literally bring a new person in, we could send them out a mailing like that same week and they would buy something else and we'd also have something in the box and they would get, we'd get like an 8 to 10% response on that. It was crazy. And then we tried to get as many of them right into the personal delivery service, the auto ship program. And and then we would have, you know, the catalog as we add more products, we'd have other products we could cross sell them. I remember once we had a what we would used to call a dash for cash every every once in a while, like, okay, you know, we're just a little bit behind our, you know, budget projections. So come up with like five ideas that you can implement like tomorrow. Okay. And um, I mean it was just kind of the very entrepreneurial environment that I worked in. It was great. And so we came up with uh this idea that not everybody was going to do the auto ship program because we had a lot of older people who maybe didn't want to give their credit cards out, that kind of thing. But they liked to buy in bulk, right? Just to make sure they mm. had enough. They weren't always paying to get another month, you know, shipped out. Mm. So we created a stock up mailing and decided to make it a summer and winter event. Mm. Like stock up before summer, stock up before the holidays, that kind of thing with special pricing for three and six month orders. 
it was just a simple mailing we sent out to our you know our buyer list and this thing did fantastic we mm. brought in so much money and the funny thing is now there's actually a woman in my neighborhood she works part-time at healthy directions and her whole job is to do stock up mailings really and then here's the other beautiful thing. She employed my son last summer as a, as a part-time babysitter. So I'm like, wait a minute. I helped create her job, and she's created my son's job. It's, it's cyclical. <laughs> it all came out of a dash for cash. <laughs> so that's really interesting. Anything else interesting that came out of the dash for cash? So the, the buy in bulk, the stock up mailing. Yep. What other uh, ideas came out of that? You're... It was a long time ago. I know. I'm shaking the cobwebs off. You are. Um, this is just too good. I have to dig in. I mean, the renewal stuff and then the, the dash for cash. This is, this is I, great. I think, you know, there's obviously been a lot of things I've discovered and worked on, you know, since that time. Yeah. Um, but there are always missed opportunities in your business. One thing I've learned from working with a lot of different companies over the years, particularly supplement businesses, is so many of them stay are so focused on acquiring new customers, mm -hmm. but they don't they just ignore the gold mine that's sitting there, right? Right, and they don't nurture the relationship. So you know you've got to nurture the relationship right from the get go, and then you've got to you know go back to these people with other things, you know, and 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 mostly focus on keeping them as customers, and it's not just a simple. I've worked with some companies that do like your first orders free or it's like f first bottle free but you go right on auto ship and there's such a huge drop off with those people mm. they don't stay on because they're not committed in the first place they didn't have to make any mm. commitment. Um, you're not yeah. necessarily getting proven buyers right so um, it's not always the best approach and I think that the companies that invest in copywriters like me who write these long form promos and then it is a hard offer, right? You've got to do cash with order or whatever. You're buying something. You're right. not just getting something for free. Those people are going to be much more likely to, to obviously to, to buy from you again and again and again. Yeah. Be proven that they're willing to spend money. And they're more committed to the product because they're more educated buyers. They pay for it. Right. But I, again, even companies that do that, they don't always nurture that back in. They just start mailing other promotions for their other products to them without really kind of reaffirming why did you you know why did you buy this in the first place like that should be reaffirmed right in the box when you get your product mm. like here's what it's going to do here's how to use it here's how you're going to what you're going to see you know etc and kind of get you re-excited about using the product so you have to kind of get them to you know you've got to you know promote that usage product mm. usage and then you got to come out to them again and you know kind of just keep reminding them of why they bought and give them opportunities to buy from you again so I just feel feel like that doesn't happen a lot, or maybe I just don't get exposed that to makes it. That mostly writing front end, but I think the smaller companies in particular don't invest a lot on that yeah. back end. You see, the big mistakes for the nutritional supplements is they're not investing in the back end, but they're probably not nurturing it. Basically, teaching people how to use it and to use it more, and getting them re, you know excited right. again keeping about them it. engaged and excited. They about just well, I mean, what did they do? Just nothing, and then just trying to sell someone else, or do you right. find they're just you know, focusing just on acquisition, acquisition? But you just go through a lot of churn. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about one of these um, nutritional supplements and what I know. Like, there's no best uh, initial offer because you said you don't want to offer something for free. They're not committed. What have you found works as far as initial offer? Maybe we pick an example. I don't know which one is your favorite, whether it's a memory or probiotic or, or digestion or um, anyone stick out that uh, initial offer worked really well um, uh, for one of these packages. You know, a lot of the offers are very similar for the supplement packages that I write. Mm -hmm. I do think people really like the, the buy you know, like the buy three, get, you know, get one free, buy six, get two free, because mm -hmm. you can really dimensionalize that in the promotion. And they like the idea of getting something for nothing. Everybody does. Right. Um, the, you know, I think in general, if you can structure your offers so that you're obviously rewarding people for buying more up front, then you're obviously going to get a much higher average order. Right. Um, I think another big mistake I see, and people don't always think about this as being part of the offer, is not having a strong guarantee. Mm. 
I see a lot of companies, you know, that want to limit it to 30 days, for example, with a supplement, which seems kind of counterintuitive if really the secret to having a successful and profitable direct mail campaign mm -hmm. is to have a high average order. Um, you know, the, you, you're trying to get somebody to buy six months worth of products, but you're only going to guarantee it for 30 days. Well, then now you're going to make it more likely that people are going to mark their calendar for day 24 mm -hmm. and say, I better ship this back if I'm going to, you know, it's just going to increase it. So almost always, and, and, and Jay Abraham, obviously, he, he's preached this all the time. Mm -hmm. I actually had the opportunity to work with him early in my career also at Phillips, uh, which was fantastic. Um, but, you know, have a strong guarantee, you know, make it unconditional and unlimited. Mm. You know, whenever you can. Go because, bolt or go home. Because when you have a deadline, people will keep that in mind. Like, I have to make my decision now. And yeah. maybe you have even, you know, especially with the supplement, it takes time to work and to see results. Right. It's not so like, take this and to... tomorrow your digestion is perfectly exactly. fine. Exactly. And then they're like, well, didn't work. I'm sending it back or I'm going to discontinue my auto ship or whatever. Um, so I think it's good to have a strong, flexible guarantee, and you're going to benefit more than you will lose from something like that. So unconditional, unlimited, is that? Whenever you can. Now, I know yeah. there's always exceptions. I had a client once who had a pretty expensive device. You know, that, that wasn't always, there was restocking, or they couldn't necessarily, re, you know, resell it again, and it was expensive to produce. So there are some challenges there, but for the most part, supplements are fairly inexpensive to produce. Right. Um, and just so, stand behind it. And, yeah, you're you know. just you're gonna get more. You're gonna actually get a higher return rate with a tighter guarantee mm -hmm. than you are with people where it just no longer is top of mind. They forget, or maybe they even stop using it. But at that point, they don't. You know, they don't care. It's not top of mind. But mm -hmm. when they only have thirty or sixty days, they feel pressure to like get results or return inside. it. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you learn from working with Jay Abraham? Oh my goodness, that's going way back. Um, well, things like the guarantee. Um, I, I still have a little special report that he wrote about headlines. I mean, mm. I got a lot of my early copy training from studying Jay Abraham and working with him. Uh, he put on a, um, oh, there's one of these massive events he put on. Uh, this is when he, he had a newsletter for a short period of time with Phillips Publishing. Uh, I'm trying to think what it was called, Business Breakthroughs or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was targeted to your audience. Uh, in fact, some of your people listening may have actually subscribed to it back in the day. Mm. Uh, but he put on a huge event in San Diego. It was like a $5,000 per person thing. And I remember going to that and he had so many great speakers, but I mean, he would be up there on, it'd be like almost midnight and he's still doing hot seats. Man. <laughs> you know? That's great. That's my kind room, of event right you know, there. It was a packed room. Like we're talking, yeah. you know, five or six ballrooms, you wow. know, so uh, what did I learn? It was just a great experience to work with him. And then uh, back in early March, I actually put on my first small uh, boot camp copywriting uh, training session. I actually had it out in Los Angeles. And as a surprise for my um, attendees, I was able to arrange at the last minute um, a meetup with Jay Abraham. Mm. We all went to his office and hung out for like an That's hour. That's awesome. Was this the girls' club or which, which? It was no. It was like oh. half guys, half gals. Okay. It was just people who heard about it through my list, and some women heard about it through my Facebook group, the girls' club. Yeah. Um, and it was it was That's just phenomenal. a great session, and then we got to go hang out with Jay Abraham afterwards. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, Kim, about your career and what you've done is from early on. It's not like there were a lot of resources or mentors um, out there, and you sort of learned on your own. Uh, there was. I think a couple of people who gave you some key advice. Um, Bob Hutchinson was yes. one. He would look over your copy, or what would he do? So he 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 did that one time at a very critical juncture. Um, I had met him back when I was working at Phillips, and he was a copywriter that had worked on. on I think at one point he had written for Jay Abraham's newsletter, and I mm -hmm. met him at that big event that I just told you about. Um, and then, yeah, several years later, uh, when I was again starting out early as a copywriter, I got a chance to write my first um, acquisition supplement promotion. It was like a big Magalog. And it was for a, a product that was like a antioxidant OPC, if anybody's heard of it, it's like a grape seed type of extract. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote this promotion. Yeah, copy was really good and strong, but it was the positioning was not right. It was, 
this does everything. It does this, it does this, it does this, it does that, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And it, and it didn't work. So my client said, you know, do you know anybody who might be able to give, give us some advice? This was a, a guy who had a, you know, his own company. I was working directly with the president of the company. So I called up Bob, and uh, he agreed to take a look at it. And he gave us some advice that, you know, and again, this is still when supplement promotions were kind of fairly new, you know, in terms right. of the acquisition type promotions. And he says, you know, what seems to be working is focusing on one key benefit, you know, a set of, you know, 16 different things. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the studies that I had and all the different things the product could do and the backstory on the doctor who was endorsing it, who used to work with Olympic athletes, et cetera. I'm like, I'm making it a joint product. So we renamed it OPC Joint Complex or whatever we called it. And I rewrote it as a uh, joint promotion. And this came mailed for like 10 years as wow. a control. Yeah, it That's was amazing. super successful. And um, so it was funny because I was, you know, I've seen Bob a few times over the years and we've kept in touch. But I was being interviewed by somebody um, earlier this year and I said you know I think I owe him lunch you owe more than that <laughs> or something <laughs> <laughs> so when I was out in LA after my boot camp we got together and I'm like you pick the restaurant and you we... pick the Hawaii vacation and I'm paying yeah yeah well yeah, I'm not gonna go on Hawaii vacation <laughs> he's married too but yeah we uh, we had a wonderful lunch right. and uh, we might actually do some boot camps together in the future that's awesome yeah, yeah. Um, I remember reading one of your um, uh, newsletters or packages on your site, and it kind of stuck out as far as that goes. And it says how an ingredient. Can I read this one? It's uh, sure. the memory one. Okay. I love this one. How an ingredient found in celery can give you memory like an elephant. <laughs> I love that headline. Do you like that headline? Yeah, that's a fantastic. It's almost a borderline too clever, but. It's working, so <laughs> We're whatever working works for a while. There's um, a person who's given me advice and about that really hit home the strong guarantee, like must have a strong guarantee. And it's also someone who gave you advice early on, Don Houtman. Yes. Um, Don yes. has from the has laid into me on guarantees before. What did what did uh, you and Don talk about? Gosh, again, I got to clear those cobwebs out. I was at a phase where writing Magalogs, it was, I was in my very early years of figuring that out. Even though I had built a reputation at Phillips as being a very good copywriter as well as marketer, I mostly was writing, you know, two page inserts or small short direct mail packages. Writing a Magalog, a long form promotion is a whole different animal. Yeah. Um, so he, he was reviewing my copy from that more that standpoint. It wasn't like let's do strong guarantees. I think he was helped he me with working a bit with of everything. Phillip? I mean, was he working with Phillips at the time? Is he did. He wrote a him? lot of financial promotions, and and so I was writing both financial and health the first several years that I was a copywriter. Yeah. So I know he reviewed one or two of my financial promotions. I used to see him at the uh, what used to be called the Newsletter of Publishers Association, but now it's changed names several times yes. over the years, but there would be a big conference in Washington, D.C., which I live outside of, um, and I'd always see Don, and so he was very generous about he is very you know, generous. a few times just yes. reviewing my copy, giving me feedback. David Deutsch did it once for me. Um, I mean, I have to give credit, you know, and I do it for, I've done it for people over the years, too, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I, I think that it... It was nice, but I never had one single mentor. Yeah. I think a lot of copywriters today um, have they have different opportunities. They can maybe be I hate the term copy cub, but they can be a copy cub for an a copywriter. There's right. a few that do that, and that's they get amazing training. There are people who can. Um, there are now a lot of companies, especially some of the Agora publishing companies, where there are doing some retainer arrangements where you kind of become exclusive for a period of time or you can even go work for them as an in-house copywriter and that's a great way to just get amazing training you know mm -hmm. right out of the gate. Um, Carlene Anglais Cole who is a fantastic uh, fellow copywriter and she and I were colleagues at Phillips um, mm. she has a very close relationship with Clayton from over the years and she worked with him uh, when she was at Phillips uh, she used to work on health and healing from the publishing side mm. So she was very involved in the marketing of that newsletter, but he mentored her quite a bit uh, over the years. So, yeah, I've kind of done it mostly on my own. There's been a few people that have helped me out, you know, along the way. Yeah. I've been just trying to get my own training, you know, all the time whenever I can, and 
and just study what's working and, you know, constantly trying to improve. So talk about the early days of Healthy Directions. How did you come up with the name? <laughs> because it was very simple. Dr. Julian Whitaker uh, already had his multivitamin that he was selling to his patients at his clinic, mm -hmm. and he called it Forward. Just Forward. Forward. So it was like, okay, Healthy Directions. Ah, got it. Okay. <laughs> <That> was... <laughs> because we were going to still call the multivitamin forward. And then the core program, in retrospect, it seems like a mouthful, but it worked. It was called the Forward Plus Daily Regimen. And it was the Forward Multivitamin, Energy Essentials, and EPA Essentials, which was the fish oil. Right. And it was three products. And so, yeah, so just healthy directions kind of tied in with forward. And that's how I came up with the name. So early on, I mean, this became you launched healthy direct help launch healthy directions and it did really well out of the gate what were some of the things early on that would be valuable for people to know about launching this multi-million dollar supplement company essentially well i mean like i said the the first thing to remember that's bob is, hutchinson um, i thought i had that turned off yeah no. <laughs> i was just talking about you um the the two things that i mentioned earlier were very key one was um we were already going to um, a really good audience. We were, in some ways, they were already following his leadership. So we were going to the best possible audience, which were already people that were customers for another part of our business. And uh, I thought I had that turned off. Oh, well, anyway. Um, and then the second part of that was, um, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, well, you said the, you know, the doctor had a following. And... You know, obviously, there was probably a built-up base of people that follow the doctor. And... Oh, yeah. There was some demand already for yeah. that product. But I guess how you would apply that to your own business is, or if you were starting a business, is there a group of people who are kind of like your low-hanging fruit that you just go after first, right? Um, th that's a good starting point. The other thing I was going to say was because we had a consumable or renewable type product, building that whole process out right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the same thing with people do now when they build funnels, you know, make right. sure you have that all built out, you know, you get, okay, now we've got these upsells, we've got this, what are you going to do beyond that, right. you know, and then how are you going to nurture that and how are you going to get those reorders and have that all fleshed out, yeah. you know, in advance and mm -hmm. have that ready to go. What did that look like early on? Like from the insert, them buying like three and get one free to what happened after that? The insert, okay, so we would get the initial sale, and then they would get something in the box, you know, with their order, it either, you know, with a coupon to use for a future order, there would also be some kind of warm and fuzzy letter, and, you mm -hmm. know, kind of reaffirming their purchase decision, here's how you want to use the product to get the best results, etc. And then you would get, again, this is all pre-email and internet. So I love it, buy, yeah. But you can buy all this, obviously, to the internet, yeah. you know, then we, and it would be a lot less expensive. And then we would send a series of three different follow-up mailings to each buyer of the core program or forward. And it was to get that next order on the way. You know, you want to keep going. You're already noticing. You're doing great things for your health. You know, if you're going to keep enjoying these benefits, the longer mm. you take it, the more you're going to see. So, you know. It's a blah, nurture blah, blah. sequence. And then we would get them into the, and then we would have one, one of those would be more targeted on the auto ship program. You know, just about what a great program was, peace of mind, worry-free, it's totally flexible, you can change it any time, or, you know, all that. But just, you know, we had a whole series that we would lead them through to get them to either reorder or get on the auto ship program. And then as we in introduced other products, we put together, it started off as a small, tiny little catalog. Now I think it's like a 36 or 42 page catalog that they have, but you know, with all the different products and we put that in the box as well. And then we would also mail that as a standalone mm. to those people and we'd get huge response. That's, that's really amazing. And would you drive them to a phone number or how would they end up purchasing? Mostly phone or mail order. Again, this is, we're talking, this is all seems like so archaic almost now back in the 90s. But again, this is all well, I feel like people, the same marketing strategy yeah. you can apply online. And you can also incorporate some mail where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, if you even if it's somebody who came to you online. Because yeah. people, you know, stuff gets lost with the emails. I mean, people will respond to them. Yeah. Ma the mailbox is a lot less crowded place these days, and things stand out more. Yeah. And I feel like, too, the older people who want whatever it is, joint or joint supplements or, 
you know, they may be an older crowd who are used to that type of purchasing, like you said. Right. right. Um, I want to, Kim, talk about um, you were the first female to hold a control border. Um, you tell me about you get a call from Brian Kurtz. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of a funny story. So I knew Brian just from when I worked at Phillips. I had met him a few times. He was, um, you know, the guy, he was like the main list guy up at boardroom. And I ran into him after I had been freelancing for a couple years at, at the, the infamous Newsletter Publisher Association Conference in D.C. And I think I was, um, I was like maybe five, four or five months pregnant with my second child. So I was at that phase where you're like, you know, is she just, has she just put on weight or is she pregnant? Like, it's, <laughs> you know, is she fat or, you know, yeah. you know I don't want to, Kim, gee, what happened since you left Phillips? I mean, I don't know. You know, I hadn't seen him in a while. <laughs> Right, and like you've grown that, since I've seen you. As a woman, you. I'm kind of just feeling like I'm kind of in that feeling a little dumpy and whatever, you know. But I, I was talking with him with a group of people, and I'm like, "Hey, I'm a copywriter now." And he's like, "Oh, okay, yeah, whatever." And he's kind of brushed me off, and I'm like, "Okay, whatever," you know, because I, you know, I again, it was like the ultimate dream to be able to write for Boardroom, right? That was like, I want to, I want to be one of those copywriters someday. And uh, so I figured nothing, you know, nothing came out of it. And then, of course, I told you the story about what happened with personal finance and. Um, after my, my second try, I, I beat Jim Rutz and got this big control. So a few months after that, uh, the marketing director from KCI was at the financial marketing roundtable meeting down in Florida, which is where all the big publishers get together to talk about what's working, what's not. And Brian asked um, the marketing director, so who's got your personal finance control? And he's like, oh, Kim Krause's got it. And he's like, he couldn't call me fast enough. I, <laughs> I was on a train actually to go to a conference in New York that he was going to be at. And he calls me on the train. He's like, hey, can you write for Boardroom? I'm like, okay. You know, so it, it, I think it just took, you know, that my, his respect for me is like, oh, she's not just like, one of the things I think I had to grapple with a little bit, even with people that I, where I was working at Phillips, because I, you know, I think people thought, Oh, well, she just stayed, she just wants to stay home with her baby. And she's kind of, it was almost like I was kind of mommy tracking myself, you know, by jumping off the corporate ladder. Cause I was, you know, pretty high up on the corporate ladder. Yeah. I walked out of a six figure a year job right, you know, yeah. in 1998. So I think I sort of, I think some people had the perception that, oh, you're just kind of doing this like part time while you, you know, stay home with the kids. And that's all well and good. But I, I was approaching it very much like a full-time job. I still yeah. had an Annie, you know, et cetera. I mean, I was working yeah. oh, full-time at this. So I think that, you know, he then he realized, oh, wait a minute. She, like, beat Jim Rutz. She's, like, she's serious. serious. Yeah. Like, okay, so um, that's how I got my break with them. Why would they want to share that? Wouldn't they want to keep, like, some secret weapons and not share it with everyone? What do you mean? You know, like, you know, oh, like the different the companies saying who table? won the – who won the control? I'm not telling you. Like I'm keeping Kim for myself. Yeah, um, well, I'm glad they didn't do that. Um, I think that they all benefit. It's like yeah. um, I, I, and that's a good lesson I think for your audience as well. Um, I think that there's a in most industries anyway. There's plenty of opportunity for everyone, yeah. and you actually benefit from from kind of helping your competitors. It, seemed, it would seem way. they seem very open all the time. Like, oh, yeah. this person just won the control, and like you know, them wanting to, to hire that person. I mean, there's some companies like Healthy Directions, for example, they don't want me to put any of my controls up on my website. They don't even want, to, because they try to keep it secret who writes for them and has their right. controls, but everybody knows, you know. Right. <laughs> but yeah, they do try to keep it. But most companies do are pretty open. And one thing I do remember from way back when we first started the Healthy Directions business is um, there was a company, and I think they're still around, a huge company called Enzymatic Therapy, and they were a very, you know, very big, su successful supplement company, and they had some ties and relationships with uh, Julian Whitaker. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my my boss and I flew up to Green Bay to meet with their the owner of the company and their their doctor formulator, and they were very open with sharing, like you know, because we were in the very early phases of our business, like what was working, what wasn't, it's and really interesting. manufacturing. We toured, you know, and I remember at one point uh, the president of the company saying, you know, there's there's plenty of opportunity here for everyone, you know, and the more er, the more people that succeed, the more we all succeed, you know, and and not just financially, but in terms of they really cared about their mission, right? right. They really right. that this was a better way. So if you really care about your mission and you really care about um, 
you know, growing your business, I think when you, it's like all ships rise, you know, you can, you can help yeah. other companies. And I think the companies that are, that tend to hold more things in and yeah. they, they will suffer ultimately. Yeah. And just like, just like the ones that, you know, don't take risk and don't encourage their employees to take smart yeah. risk. Yeah. You know, you, they will, you know, ultimately, you know, limit themselves. That is the saying of Rise 25, rising tides lift all boats. We 100% yeah, yeah. believe in that and that works. Um, talk about, you know, Kim, the challenges of navigating family and business because that's not an easy, um, I don't find it easy to navigate. So give me your words of wisdom on okay. then and then up to now. Yeah, I'm still figuring that out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I think the key thing is make sure you have the support you need. Um, and I'm just saying that it doesn't apply even if it was a guy that was staying home and let's say the wife was going off, you know, to the corporate world. In this case, my husband's always had a job outside the house and I, you know, for the last 19 years have worked from home. So, um, I've always made sure that, I mean, I, I was telling this to Ben Subtle the, a few months ago, I probably haven't cleaned a toilet in 22 years <laughs> and that's good, you know, but I mean, it doesn't make sense for me to try to do housework, for example. That's one thing, like if I can delegate it out, you know, let me delegate it out, right? I mean, for a period of time, I had somebody come in twice a week when, you know, kids were younger and right. I'd have people doing my laundry and, you know, I, I didn't have to worry about as many of those household tasks. Um, but yeah, so I think as a woman or somebody working from home, if you're still trying to do all that, um, I'm going to close my window for a second because they're yeah. starting to move along. Speaking of delegating. Yeah, you're like, uh, we've... <laughs> Speaking of delegating. So, you know, get the support you need. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you have flexibility. I mean, I, I can work early in the morning if I want or I can work late at night. Yeah. If I need to go take my kids to school or to a doctor's appointment like when they were younger, you know, I can just make time for yeah. that. So it does give you a lot of flexibility yeah. to, to be self-employed. Yeah. Delegation, it sounds amazing. Some people have a hard time with it. They're just so used to doing certain things. I well, think. I, and that can be part of your, your relationship with your spouse or partner, too. You know, yeah. one thing I learned early on um, is, and I think a lot of women do this. I mean, again, because I'm talking to the women in the audience, but maybe some men do it, too. But, yeah. like, your husband wants to do something to help. Let's say you finally get to that point where he's like, what can I do to help? And then he does it like not the way that you would do it. And then you criticize him. And then he's like, I'll never, you know, he's never. <laughs> that never to happens in marriage. Do. Criticizing. Come on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I never do that to my husband. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, one thing that I learned uh, after I had my first child and I was still at Phillips and I was going through this period of, there was a lot of changes in what my role was at the company. And I was trying to decide if I, did I want to take the leap and become a freelance copywriter? Or was I going to stay there? Or actually, I had some other job offers I was considering. So I, I decided to just go off to a, uh, a spa in Arizona for like three days or four days just so I could go away and think, you know. Uh, I had my son was like maybe eight or nine months old, but I actually left him with my husband for like, because you know, a lot of new moms just are like, oh, there's no way I can even leave him for the day, you know. But, you know, my my husband stepped up and he took care of him and, you know, and and I was able to go away and come back. But that also was a big part of being able to trust him more that, hey, it's OK. Like, it doesn't have to be all me. You know, my husband is actually capable. Although there were those days I'd come home sometimes like, so what the kids have for lunch? Oh, were they supposed to have lunch? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> They're supposed to nap? Phone what are you husband talking at about? noon and say, did you feed them? Um but I yeah. I'm sure I've been guilty of several of those type of things <laughs> that you're like, are you kidding me? So. <laughs> so part of it is just with anything when you're in management, and I've been in management positions. You know, you got to learn to be able to delegate to your employees and yeah. let go. And sometimes things aren't always going to be done perfectly the way you would do them. Mm -hmm. so Kim, opportunities for training. <laughs> this has been absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you. I have one last question, but where should we point people towards to check out online? So they can go to my website, which I, at this point anyway, I haven't updated in like eight years. Which really? You I think mentioned. it looks pretty good. Mschwam.com. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot For more. For eight years? That's, that's good. Well, some of those have are still mailing or have been mailing until recently. It's timeless, just like your website. <laughs> yeah, I and would encourage I, anyone to go into the portfolio section. Um, I mean, there's, there's a wealth of, of uh, information here. 
but it's it's really golden. So thank you. Yeah. I also have another site where people can get a free uh, report that I put together, um, and it's the A-List Copywriters Manifesto, but it has seven success principles for winning promotion, mm -hmm. and you can get that at themarketingsuperpower.com. Mm -hmm. Themarketingsuperpower.com. Yeah, so it's got the okay. in front of it, so themarketingsuperpower.com, yeah. mm -hmm. and you can just opt in to that list, and I, I'm not going to email you all the time because I'm just too busy but if I do have something interesting I will email you but you can definitely um, that way you'll get that report sent to you via email yeah and you'll also if you're a woman who's an entrepreneur marketer copywriter you'll find out details um, via an email about how to sign up for my my free private Facebook group called the, the girls, girls club. club yeah which is really growing and we've got a great community and we're actually having a a free call that I'm doing with people tonight uh, where we're going to be talking about negotiating strategies and communicating effectively with clients and we also sometimes do like girls club meetups and we have every month we have a girl on fire that we uh, celebrate who's doing some cool stuff uh, with her uh, career and it's just a great community where you can just ask questions and get support yeah. so I encourage all the women to check, check it out. out check it out um, Kim, so my last question is, I mean, I could go on for hours and hours and <laughs> go through every single one of your promotions, but I won't. I'll spare you. Um, the, on the, the marketingsuperpower.com, so I was able to check it out, and um, I figured maybe you'd talk about one thing that we haven't talked about so far that would be important um, that you know, obviously helps create winning promotions. What have we not covered? I mean, obviously, they can go to the marketingsuperpower.com and get all seven and, and get your information. What's one that we haven't talked about so far? Yeah, that's... I think research is my secret weapon. Mm. I exhaustively research things. I mean, I spend at least a third of the period of time that I work on a promotion probably doing research. Mm -hmm. And it's either, you know, especially with supplements, you've got to dig up the studies you got to, if there's more than one nutrient, you got to figure out which one's got the best story that maybe you want to highlight or lead with. Um, you want, you know, all the proof, the credibility, you want the quotes, you want to know about who's endorsing it. I mean, I could go on. There's so much stuff to research. I, I even call up and interview customers who've been using the product, mm. talk to them. Yeah. Um, research is, is huge and that can really, you can tell when someone's written a supplement promotion and they have not done adequate really? research. Yeah. The untrained eye. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting. You look at the side column of the of the issue um, and just some amazing, I mean, would you call them bullets or what do you call them? Which like, one are you looking at? I'm looking at the, I just keep going back to the how First. an ingredient found in celery can give you memory like an elephant. Oh, I don't have that one in front of me. Um, um, why decades of toxic exposure are taking a toll on your brain. You know, there's a bunch of the ones on the side, the amazing memory secret of the ancient Rishi, so yeah. you have a bunch of these yeah. um, that... Yeah, you just try to figure out, like, and those I, 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 I pretty much write at the very end because it's after I've written my copy and I'm going back, okay, what are my most exciting things to kind of pull mm -hmm. people in and hitting the most benefits? I have a funny quick story on that, though. Yeah, go. Um, so I, I've written a lot of promotions for Soundview, which is their advanced bionutritionals business, mm -hmm. and Paris Lampropoulos is their copy chief, and he's over the years written several for them as well. So he had a, a joint uh, supplement control, it might still be the control, that they've been mailing for, for quite a while. And I, know, I got it in the mail one day, and I realized that that little table contents you know, sidebar on the front cover, it had all the bullets for my um, bone support control promotion, and somehow they had gotten overlaid, maybe the same designer mm. had done, and had put those on that cover and left them on the joint one, but they were all about the osteoporosis bone support one, but it was still working. It was still working. <laughs> and so they were loath to change it because, well, I don't know, I mean, I don't think it was something they were going to, you know. Because, you know, when you have a control, just like a scientific experiment, you don't want to, if you change one thing, you don't know, well, is that going to tilt the balance? And then you right. want to do any kind of big change, you always want to test it first. I think they might still be purposely mailing it wow. with the wrong bullets there because it's working. <laughs> <laughs> That's Isn't that pretty funny. Only you would, like, discover that, I guess. So. <laughs> but joints, bones, you know, they're all kind of It's the same. related <laughs> in some one sense. 
Kim, thank you so much. Everyone should check out. We'll link up all those sites. It's an absolute pleasure. Your oh. your uh, website is a goldmine. So I hope people oh, check it you. out. So thank, thank you, you so for all you do. Great talking Appreciate with you it. today. All right. Bye-bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.